I have two extraordinary uh, people in the front for you to listen to. And uh, je, vais, uh, je vais les présenter. Uh, la première personne qui va vous parler, c'est Ali Chasson. Non, non. non c'est Guy Matt, qui est directeur général de la Fondation canadienne pour le dialogue des cultures dont l'objectif est de soutenir et de promouvoir le dialogue entre les différentes composantes de la société canadienne. Ancien président de la Fédération euh, des communautés francophones acadiennes, dans le temps FCFA, ou dans le temps encore, M. Matt a également été directeur général de l'Association des enseignants et des enseignants franco-ontariens. So, uh, Guy, uh, c'est pas dans mes notes, là, mais Guy uh, a été vu uh, de donner uh, le prix de pilier de la francophonie. Hier, hier soir, Guy? Hier soir, oui, une grosse colonne. Une grosse colonne. Une grosse colonne. <laughs> And um, his, uh, his wealth of experience and the depth of his understanding um, in official language minority communities it's, is, is, is extraordinary, and we will benefit from that uh, today. Now, my second friend, Ali Chiasson. Natif de, de Cap-Saint-Jacques, à Terre-Neuve, et Labrador, Ali est directeur général de la Société de l'Acadie du Nouveau-Brunswick et PDG de la firme de consultants Option. So, um, Ali and I uh, work as, uh, together as um, uh, sister organizations, the QCGN within the province of Quebec and he in SNB and also on the national stage. Um, Monsieur Chiasson, Ali, Uh, uh, pour la grande partie de sa carrière, travaillé pour la francophonie de Terre-Neuve et Labrador du Canada. Il a été uh, également directeur de la Fédération des francophones de Terre-Neuve et du Labrador de 1987 à 2006, où il a contribué à mettre sur pied le Conseil scolaire francophone provincial provisoire de Terre-Neuve. So, He knows a ton of stuff about school boards and a ton of stuff of everything that we feel is important for those of us who are in the room today. Uh, J'invite Guy à prendre la parole. Merci, Sylvia. Première chose, je ne suis pas un chercheur. I am not the one of those people that you were talking about this morning that knows a lot about statistics and uh, research papers and things like that. I'm an activist, and I've been an activist all my life, and what I want to share with you this morning is that part of activity that we've done in the province of Ontario mostly uh, over the last, see my beard, uh, quite a while. Bon, alors, good morning. The, I strongly believe that the Anglophone communities from Quebec and Francophones in the rest of the country have a lot more in common than not. But first, a reality check. No government is going to grant us rights out of the goodness of their heart. Everything we got, none of it was a gift. We pride it right out of the clutch of their closed fist. <laughs> and that goes even for an assistant deputy minister right here. <laughs> How do we do this? We do it because we cajole people. We surround them. We nurture them. We threaten them. We go down on the street. We go talk to other people. We take example from somewhere else. Or we go to court. But nobody is going to give you anything out of the goodness of their heart. If you want something, you have to go and get it. And that's the lot and the fate of all uh, uh, minority language organizations and people, uh, communities in this, uh, in this country. In 19, just to show you, in 1986, there was a, the, during, in the Globe, in the Mail at the time before it became the Globe and Mail, there was something that says, There are schools in Prescott Russell, which is the francophone region in, in near Quebec border in Ontario, where they nurse not only an alien tongue, but an alien customs, an alien sentiment, a wholly alien people. And they were talking about my people. 
I felt like ET. Maybe I should go to another, I don't know, I go to another planet or something. But when it starts like this, you know it's not going to go well. And that was in 1886. So how did we, how did we manage to go from that perspective to where we are today? And I think that's where I would like to lead us and show the, the, uh, what the education system has done in order to change that perspective in our province. We started very, very low, as I just stated. After 1901, and specifically in 1911, the government of Ontario, who was a bunch of members of the Loyal Order of Orange, maybe some of you are members of that here, I don't know, <laughs> but there was a lot of them in Ontario, and certainly in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Ontario and the rest of the country, they were really in the government, they were prime ministers, they were premiers, they were members of cabinet, they were the Loyal Order of Orange, so it was a kind of a gang that was brought together, the Anglo-Protestant and the Anglo-Irish Catholic. So it didn't help us at all as a community. So they adopted, made Regulation 17. Regulation 17 forbid the instruction of French in all school in the province. That's in 1911. So at that time, what did we do? Because up to then, we had schools mostly through religious uh, through parish schools and things like this, but we had schools in the province. So uh, this kind of put a big stop, and uh, it was a rallying cry for our community. That's where the Francophone community got really together after that Regulation 17. Thank God for those bad government who managed to give us a reason to get together. Count on the government of Quebec sometimes to do that, maybe. No, <laughs> did, who knows? I don't want to put the judgment on this. It's up to you to decide. But that Regulation 17 really was a rallying cry. And we taught French while hiding from the government inspectors. And we did that until 1927. We had those schools underground in schools, in, in, uh, in churches, or even in schools. And the teachers were teaching in French. And when the inspector was coming, hiding all the books, and, and the mothers were there at the doors and stopping the inspector from coming in until we could put all the things away. You know, it was a good time, you know. We really enjoyed ourselves. And we did this through the province. It was in Ottawa, but it was also in Pembroke, and it was in North Bay, and it was in all across the province. And after this 15 years of, of Regulation 17, the government realized <laughs> we cannot beat them, might as well join them. So they tolerated Tolerated. Did not say you have the right to, but it said, ah, you want to do it, all right, give us, break, give us a break and, and teach in French and do whatever you want, but we don't want to make it official. And it was only in the 1960s, only in the 1960s, which means my generation, only when I was a teacher, was the teaching of French legalized in elementary and secondary schools in the province of Ontario. So you're talking about something that is relatively uh, uh, new, or recent, not new, maybe, recent that this, uh, this, this uh, reality is we have now the right to have schools where French can be taught. And since then, and I've witnessed this growth over the years, we have, uh, we, 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 we've seen growth. We sued the government and in 1984 and won over the right to manage our own schools. And I think this morning the commissioner talked about that. So that was great time. I mean, we, I remember being at the, the Supreme Court of Ontario, being in the course when the, the judge just decided to ask, ask questions. And I'll give you an example. You know, the story was uh, the, 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 the government representative said, you know, they don't have the right to, to teach their own, the right to manage their own school. It's like la plume de ma tante. La plume de ma tante does not necessarily mean it belongs to ma tante. It might be belong to my uncle or to somebody else. And the judge says, Ben là, monsieur l'avocat, la plume de ma tante, c'est la plume à ma tante. So la, les conseils scolaires de la minorité, c'est à la minorité. And after he said that, that kind of blew the balloon, the air out of the balloon of the government representative there, and uh, he lost his job. We had also, you know, we also had a liberal and new, uh, now I'm coming back to your CAC government, a little bit, just, no, just to give you an example. We had liberal governments, we had new democrat, democratic 
NDP government of Ontario. Huge amount of promises. Oh yes, we're gonna do so many things for you. Don't worry, you know, we are your friends and all that. What happened did nothing. And it took a conservative government like under Mike Harris, which we don't think is known as the best friends of all the minorities, but he's the guy who decided, among other things, because he wanted to reduce the number of school boards, he decided there would be French language school boards in the province of Ontario covering the entire province. So we have to realize that sometimes your friends in high places are not those that you thought, that you taught, thought, no H there, eh? that you thought, c'est pas ceux auxquels on pensait, mais véritablement d'autres qui sont là. Et c'est pour ça qu'il faut toujours faire attention aux gouvernements qui sont en place et travailler avec les gouvernements qui sont en place pour réussir à faire des changements séminaux dans, les, dans ce que nous voulons avoir. C'est évident que lui, quand il a fait ça, il y avait aussi la, la décision de la Cour. There was a court decision before. Uh, he wanted to reduce the number of school boards. That, remember also there was all this case about Montfort Hospital that was mired. There was a huge amount of outcry across the country. So the timing was good for us, and we're glad that he did it at that time. Since then, we also got two uh, trade colleges in French and are now expecting the start of a French language university in Toronto eventually, although this has been promised, but we'll see uh, what happened in the next couple of years. It's uh, interesting to note also that on 22nd of February 2016, Kathleen Wynne, who was then the Premier of the Province of Ontario, issued a formal apology to Franco-Ontarian for the adoption of Regulation 17 and the harmful impact on our community. So at least there's a recognition within our province that we, they were, that we were badly treated and things are changing. Uh, now, over the years, we have invested a lot of energy with the different political parties and government. And if I may say something to QCGN and others, it's not enough just to, in, to, to go publicly and to talk. You have to be in those political parties, around those political parties, and you have to be also around the civil service. You have to be close to this Mr. Colpitz over there. You have to nurture him. You have to go and stroke him once in a while. <laughs> you know, he, needs, he needs this. Let me tell you, he needs this. So lots, he can. He lots can, of love required. Lots of love required. And uh, that, that's very important. And that's something that we've learned to do within our, within, within our community to make sure that things would go our way and not always their way. Uh, since the 1980s, we have a ministry or a minister responsible for Francophone affairs. We had a ministry of Francophone affairs for about six months. <laughs> and then when the new government came, it changed from ministry of Francophone affairs to ministry responsible for Francophone affairs. Doesn't change anything. We had the same number of people in the staff working for the minister. And uh, the, but the, I guess the perspective was different. But that was a major gain. That was a major gain to have a minister responsible for Francophone affairs, a minister. I don't mean to say a parliamentary assistant to somebody else, but I mean a minister, a full minister responsible for Francophone affairs because that minister, when strong, can be or can and would influence legislation, policies, regulations put forward by her or his colleagues. And that's what we've seen in the last 20 years of what those ministers we had, Madame Meilleur, then Madame Lalonde, and now we're seeing it with Madame, Mulroney, Madame Mulroney, uh, who is the minister responsible for Francophone affairs in the province of Ontario. She's, the, she's a good former Quebecer, I guess. Now she lives in Toronto. So, um, and also the daughter of the other guy. So I guess she knows a little bit about politics. You know, she told me, she told me when I met her um, a few weeks ago, I think we have one more minister in the cabinet that we knew because my father calls me every night and tells me, tell, say this to this minister and say this to that minister that you should do that minister. She feels that there's another minister somewhere around the table. <laughs> now, uh, in 2002, uh, a previous minister, Madame Meyer, decided to create a consultative committee on Francophone affairs uh, to help her shape the policies that the government was putting forward or was going to put forward in relation to French language services. As you know, we have a French language service act. There's a French language services uh, that has to be provided in 22 region. I think it's 22. 
areas in the province covering about 80, 85 percent of the Francophone population where we are entitled to the services of provincial government in our language, in, in French. And this is pretty well, this is pretty well taken care of and I think at noon, you probably will hear from our commissioner of official, uh, commissioner for French language services, Francois Boileau, because it's something that the government has really, the previous government, and I think this government and the civil service have taken to heart and are really serious about to give services in French in all the regions that have been designated. We have many consultative committee. We have one for Francophone affairs, one for education, one for justice, one for health. And they're all designated by the minister and by the lieutenant governor in council, which means we are quasi civil servant. I chair the, Francophone com the, the Consultative Committee on Francophone Affairs. My job is to make sure that the minister doesn't stop on landmines, that she knows where, go where, where things are going to happen, if there's going to be a flare up somewhere in the province related to French language service that she knows, so she can do something about it before the government is embarrassed or before she is embarrassed or before a minister is embarrassed. So it's important to her to have a committee that serves her well. We are not lobbyists for the members, for the community. We're not, but of course, we're all from the community, from all over the province. So of course, when we bring things to the table, it's because we heard that there, there, will be, there, will, there, will be, there could be problems or something needs to be solved, and we bring solution to the minister. <laughs> then she can go and do something about it. Just to give you an example, under the uh, previous government, I don't know how it's going to be with this one yet, we're still working together. Under the previous government, the consultative committee made about, over time, about 100 recommendations. 99 of those recommendations were accepted and taken by the minister, and she did something with it. So to me, it's not a bad record. But it's because the minister felt that the advice coming from the committee was something that would be useful to her. And she did not feel that we were lobbyists for groups. And I think uh, you should think about this when you talk about your advisory committee on education or the advisory committee to the parliamentary assistant or the responsible for Anglophone affairs, that these people be viewed as helping the guy or the woman, the person, I should say, uh, attain their goals or do something about it. It's, uh, to me, that's important that they feel the confidence that the discussions they're going to have is not going to find itself in the Gazette the next morning or in the other places. When you do that, both the civil service and the, the politicians have confidence that the results are going to be profitable for them. And I think you get stronger then as a community if you have groups like this closer to the ministry, to the ministers, and to the civil servant. As I said, the model that we had with Francophone Affairs, that model was replicated uh, in, in other ministries, as I said, health, education, justice for the time being. And I know the other minister finding this interesting are considering also maybe we should have one to tourism, for example, is looking at, at a, as a consultative committee on tourism because it's important to know that there's a large Francophone communities. We have business, we have B&B, we have Airbnb, we have uh, restaurants, we have uh, uh, places to, to go and see where Francophones were to exploit. So there's our corridors, the Champlain corridors, for example, or the no, 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 Route 17. So how do we attract Francophones from Quebec and from outside Quebec, from, from, from France, for example, or Belgium, other countries, to come to Ontario and instead just staying in Montreal or going to Quebec City, to come to my province and see how vital our community is. So that's what we are there. We are there to, uh, to, to, to help the civil service also. And I think that's an important part. We have the right to ask the civil service to come to our meetings, to our committee meetings, and ask them what are they doing in their ministry for Francophone affairs. So how do you implement policies? How do you make sure that, uh, that, that the uh, uh, French Language Services Act is going to be five minutes, no problem. Uh, yes, no problem. Uh, the, the, the French Language Services Act is going to be uh, enhanced. I'll give you an example. We had a meeting with the Ministry of Transport. The deputy minister came, and you know these big signs over the, uh, over the highways, you know, it shows uh, don't drink and drive, don't, you know, don't do this, don't do that, and all these don'ts that we can't do anymore. And don't use the phone. 
over the, the big highways. So we asked the guy, why, the deputy minister, why don't you have that in both official languages? Because, you know, in those areas where we have right to be serviced in French, French language services, it should be, well, you know, we wanted to do it, but, you know, we couldn't put the accent. And because there's not enough pixel, we couldn't put the accent. So I said, well, I don't care. I mean, put it, forget the accent. We'll imagine, well, we cannot do this. But next generation, we will be, next generation of pixelite stuff will be able to do it. Two years later, I'm driving on the Queensway, and one morning I see that huge thing that is put there, a new screen that had been put, and now it was French and English. And if you go through Ontario, through the major highways, all these signs now will be in English and French. So, you know, you have an input, you have an impact on the civil service for them to be able to do something when you've got a committee that the ministry or the parliamentary secretary to the premier, in your case, if he's well surrounded by people who can give him good um, content. Now, onto the role of education and all of this for minority uh, language com uh, communities. The creation of French language school boards in the 1990s was a challenge. For example, we had to set up 11 school boards at the same time. In all of Ontario, there was but one financial officer knowledgeable in school finances. But we had to find 10 for the following start of the following year. So, and there were but two people who were knowledgeable in terms of executive director of a school board. So, you know, we were, oh boy, are we gonna be able to do this? But we did it, we learned on the spot. Uh, now we have a cadre of financial experts in school board education and in departmental finance. We have school board's official and trustees who are knowledgeable in the education legislation. So that strengthened our community. But we have also uh, performing students. Our students are, in Ontario, the best performing students in all subject matter, as shown by the EQAO, the Educational Quality Evaluation, something that is a network of, uh, that is uh, under the province of Ontario. So we have gone a long way over the, next, the last 25 years. At the Ministry of Education, we have a total department under a French assistant deputy minister of some 80 French language staff. French language staff charged with the responsibility of programming and financing the French language schools and the French language school boards. So we don't have to go to a translation, we do our own programming. We don't have to translate what's coming from, from the image. We have our own program officers that develop our own programs. French language education policy is not a translation of English education policy. As such, it maintains a distinct character. And as such, it seems there's a big difference between the role of schools in Quebec and Ontario. Our schools, as a policy that is defined as the implementation by educational institution of planned systemic intervention to ensure the protection, enhancement, and transmission of French language and culture in a minority setting uh, to counter the gradual assimilation of its member into the Anglo-Canadian community. As such, we are no more free as a we are so more free as a system to do this then it seems that the Anglophone system in Quebec can do, which as far as I could see when I read the report, read the report, that you have more, I won't go there, but you understand what I mean. Now, since the role of the school is to ensure the protection, enhancement, and transmission of French language culture, French Ontarians have given their school boards a larger mandate than education of the young. They have to be a motor in community development. And as such, we have seen school boards acquiring community centers and partnering in their operation. We have seen large support of our mission uh, artists, uh, museum artists, authors, local media outlet by our school boards. They are now large institutions with capacity, with money, so that helps. We, had about, we have about uh, 455 French language schools in Ontario, of which 350 are elementary. Enrollment is up 14,000 in the last 10 years, bucking the dropping enrollment uh, across Ontario from the English system. We had, when we started 25 years ago, we had 45 private secondary schools. Now we have three times 
that number in the province of Ontario. So it is evident that the full and complete management of a school system has given a big amount of confidence to Ontarians, to Franco-Ontarians in their abilities, which is why we are more and more uh, we more and more demand that the different sphere of human activities be protected and under management of our community. We see this in health. We do it in health. We require it in social welfare, in justice, in tourism, and in culture, taking example on what we've done in the education system. Now I will be a little bit, just to finish, just a little bit pretentious. Wet lessons for Quebecers. <laughs> That's pretentious. I am sorry to say that our ways and means may not be very helpful to you. Our community is not seen anywhere as threatening the customs or the existence of the majority, whereas here it seems, or from our impression, it seems that quite a few Francophones view Anglophones in Quebec as threatening their culture and language. And uh, I, if you've seen, there was a little problem with Madame Bombardier, Denise Bombardier, in the last couple of, last week. Uh, it, certainly, it certainly made us realize how different we are. In any case, the future of your community lays on your own shoulder. Nobody is going to do it for you. And as I said in the beginning, you can only count on yourself. I wish both our community good luck and a prosperous future. Thank you very much. I would suggest that we hold our questions uh, until after Ali has, uh, has given his presentation. And I thank uh, Guy for his uh, very uh, uh, provocative and insightful uh, discussion. Bonjour, en Acadien. Hello, in English. Gwe, en Mi'kmaq. There you go. Okay. I was under impressions that are different at what I have realized here this morning. I'm, um, so yeah, my accent is a bit different, so you know, if you're gonna think, if you, if you want something, I get not by, the wrong guy, wrong room, wrong day. I, I regret to say that what I had presented, again, is not probably gonna work. So I'm gonna probably change my strategy a little bit and kinda speak to you about my own evolution and how that evolution pertains to what I've done in my life, where I've ended up now, and what I see as becoming, in my opinion, uncontrollable uh, strategies that will probably enable us to survive in the future. Again, as a Newfoundlander, an Acadien de Terre-Neuve, uh, first and foremost, um, I can't relate at all to what I do every day in New Brunswick. It's two different worlds. I can tell you that in 1949, I can tell you that in 1504, uh, Newfoundland was the first North American jurisdiction to receive the French. In 1904, the Entente Cordiale between English and France ceded Newfoundland permanently to the English. However, uh, the French retained a French fishing right up until 1972. So I will say we were the first to see the French come, and we were the last to see them leave. In 1949, when Newfoundland became a, a, um, the 10th province, uh, people were very happy because they said, well, okay, we're, you know, we're gonna be able to go and reunite with our long lost Acadian sisters and brothers and life as we know it will be never the same again. Didn't quite work that way. Between 1949 and 1968, 19 years later, of which there was an official languages act, we waited until 1994 to receive right to education in French in Newfoundland Labrador, of which I was one of the first people to be uh, appointed by the government to put together a Francophone school board. I later eventually presided over that, chaired that school board in my last, in my last functions as a, as, a, as a taxpayer in Newfoundland Labrador before moving to New Brunswick. In New Brunswick it's different because we are a bilingual province Une province officiellement bilingue. Uh, that's what how Air Canada would say it if you were on a plane. <laughs> um, we have duality. What does that mean? A, that's a very, very interesting concept that a lot of people don't really get. 
In education in New Brunswick, there are two systems in parallel. It, they, all, they, all, they all respond to one common deputy minister, but the, there are two assistant deputies, one for the Anglophone track and one for the Francophone track. Okay? And they don't really work together other than because they have actually quite separate systems, and they deliver two parallel systems of, of, of education to two different language communities, which works great. I think it's, a, it's the model I think to follow in Canada. Um, it has limitations, of course. Um, obviously, it creates uh, a very uh, inward-looking system okay, that, that responds to the needs of one community or the other. There's not a whole lot of collaboration, so there's a whole, there's a whole two solitude existence, you know, two pillars. Um, we won't really spend a whole lot of time on that, but what I'll tell you is this, is I will tell you that, we'll, we'll go back to, 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 to school board governments, and I'm, I think there's gonna be method to my madness there, so hang on with me. Um, I think you have to have a very, very solid foundation in school board governance uh, if you want to ensure any kind of control over especially cultural development. Um, I was kind of surprised to see not a whole lot of youth here. And I'm, I'm kind of a big advocate of uh, engaging youth at a very early age. And what I mean by that is in early high school, 12, 13, 14 years old. I think you have to, you have to create strong youth organizations, strong youth organizations that foster leadership early on. Uh, that the school board, that does, you know, that you're, that you're um, you know, that well, your groups in schools, whatever they be, you know, uh, school councils, whatever, are, are very vocal. Um, and not only planning to dance for Friday night, but they actually have a more important role to play in developing leadership. Uh, they're also your feeder groups when those people get older, right? When they hit university, when they hit their private life, and start paying, you know, becoming taxpayers. They're important to have already them you know, kind of as a, as a feeder group to replace you people, okay? We're going to try to speak a little bit about what we call, uh, what, I, what I call, um, um, is education sufficient? I believe sincerely that education, my, my world, education in French, okay, is not sufficient. It's only the beginning. Assimilation, bilingualism, all that kind of stuff, okay, has to be controlled within the confines of total school governance, okay, as a model uh, for and by the linguistic minority group who manages those schools, okay. Um, is it fundamental or is it some kind of a, a fundamental doctrine? I believe it to be completely and utterly necessary. So. If we go and we look at the fundamentals, okay, of um, of the battle, I call it the battle there, okay, towards French education in Western Canada, okay, and if you att attend that to assimilation, bilingualism, whatever, okay, and if you you have to attach that to some kind of a formal def definition of what total school governance is, and there's whole there's not a whole lot of definitions of that, okay, we'll get to one. The only one that I've been able to find, find so far, anyway. So, once you actually attained full school governance, what do you do with it? Okay, what does it mean? Okay, well, so what, who's it beneficial for? Uh, so, what questions can we ask ourselves, right, in order to be able to, main, to, 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 to foster a maximum retention of every benefit we can gain from that total school administration? So, minus all the efforts in New Brunswick over the last 50 years, okay, French is still regressing. Okay? We, we haven't won that battle yet. Okay? And the, the large-scale omni-government initiatives okay, in terms of regional development although haven't really changed a whole lot either. Okay? Acadians are still poorer than their Anglophone counterparts. Uh, they still make money, they, they're still less educated. There's, there's, a, there's a very, very important um, 
level of lesbitism um, around uh, Illiteracy among, among francophones, okay? So we spend a lot of money, okay, that level to, to obtain really uh, results that I think are mediocre. Uh, our rural areas continue to empty themselves, okay? There is a huge uh, rural urban divide. There is a huge north south divide. So basically, the north is francophone, rural. The south is anglophone, urban, in a large part. And the homogeneous francophone regions are more and more fragile. Okay? Because there's 235,000 francophones in the Canes and Brunswick, there are 60,000 who are unilingual francophone. Okay? So about 25%. So, from 1951 to 2011, the percentage of francophones has diminished from 35.9 to 32.5. May not be a lot, but if you're looking at a political distribution in the province of New Brunswick, it starts to become important. So, francophones are more and more bilingual. If you look at the uh, bilingual rates in New Brunswick, francophones outweigh anglophones bilingual by three to one. Okay, so in over 50 years, it's not anglophones who bilingualize; it's francophones who become bilingual. So official languages, as a as a as a government initiative, as a government ideal, okay. Uh, so between the francophones who accord an enormous importance to that. Anglophones are less so. And the consequence of that is we, we, we have elections like we just had two weeks ago where you know, the People's Alliance can, you know, can get three seats, of which they are a blatant anti bangladesh party with overtones of you know, Trumpism, whatever, populism, whatever. You, know, you put as political scientists, you put all kinds, of, all kinds of overtones to that, but let's try to keep it simple. So assimilation is what? Again, there's a whole strange definition of assimilation. You can, you know, in, in 1990, when I was uh, associated with the Fédération des Jeunes, we had done a major important study called Visa d'Avenir. And basically, we arrived at, again, I, I think it's a very, very good definition of what assimilation is. Okay? It's, a pheno it's a social phenomenon okay, that is an accommodation, an integration of individuals or by groups from their environment into their, into their immediate environment, whatever, whatever important environment that is. Uh, it has a consequence, direct, uh, to reduce the capacity of the community to renew itself against or pertaining to very strong assimilation rates. Communities, uh, you know, start feel they start feeling the depth of the loss. Uh, they become depossessed, frustrated, uh, and the end result is. Uh, the actual exterior force, you know, uh, wins over their own individual identity. So you actually, you know, now there's a whole kinds of so all kinds of social utterances to that. Okay, and we will have a long, we can have a lot, all kinds of conversations. But as a rule, in 1990, we went, and we, we went, and we uh, met over 10,000 young francophones from across the country. That was what we came up with. I would suspect if you're living in that Tashkwana Zanglophone, it probably resembles that. I'm also a lifetime member of Alliance Quebec Youth Wing, by the way. That was a good story. So what do, what do linguists say? Okay? And, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. Well, linguists say that, you know, in the last number of, 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 of centuries, okay, uh, We've, we've lost a whole a lot of languages, okay? And we still lose language almost every day. And Hagej, who was, he was a, one, of the, one of our you know, eminent linguists, okay? Uh, he says we're, we're losing one every 15 days. Uh, the worst is that you don't really recognize it. It kind of happens. You kind of wake up one morning and say, hmm, I'm, I'm, I'm searching my words in English all of a sudden, or I'm, I'm searching my words in French. 
so one of the worst situations, and I'm from Newfoundland, so this is something that I, that I respond to very well, is when a language or when a, when a, when a community is numerically you know, very, very, very weak, uh, and it's spread out over a very, very large territory, okay, uh, it's just a matter of time. There's a no, there's a no win, there's a no win scenario to that. There are there are ways to work against that, but okay, theoretically speaking, that's what it means. And once the process has started, it's extremely difficult to reverse it. Very difficult. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of resources. So in the initial phase, okay. The minority is persuaded to learn the second language, to learn the language of the majority, okay? Uh, because it will help him or her enrich their cultural life and get him a job, all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, and it's, you know, whole, whole idea of globalism, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and bilinguals, you know, institutional bilingualism, obviously, it favors, you know, unilingualism because, obviously, the the the... the the, the obligation of bilingualism becomes a state issue. If you look in New Brunswick, who learns French? You know, who, 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 who becomes bilingual is Francophone because they don't feel the obligation. Someone else will take care of the issue, okay? Some, bureau, some bureaucrat in Fredericton will take care of that, so I don't have to go to, okay? Um, and if bilingualism becomes a standardized issue in the community, so everybody's bilingual, okay? As certain people in the room would say, well, there's one language too many. Okay. And that's when it gets a bit dangerous. And cities, generally, okay, become bastions of assimilation. Okay. Uh, and obviously, rural areas, like in New Brunswick, can remain unilingual. So we can go talk about the loss of languages, whatever. I'll, I'll kind of cut to the chase on that one. So. Let's talk about the whole definition of what school, de school governance is as a model. It's the only definition we've been able to find, okay, that encompasses a whole vision of what it should be. And that was Daniel Bourgeois who wrote that in a study. And this is what he said. He said, the exercise of the school board as an administrative unit, okay, has to be autonomous from the state, Okay, has contr exclusive control over the needs of the school community. The, 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 the financial needs, okay, and the, and the funds required to have instruction in institutions of language, the schools, recruiting, selection, and mandating of personnel, teaching personnel, the appointment of Staff at all levels, starting with obviously a school board director or a director of education. The creation and the and 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 the outweigh of school programs, all contractual negotiation and uh, bonding of uh, contracts and services. Okay. Interpret, uh, to determine where schools can be built, okay? Uh, obviously adhere to a very high standard of education, so, uh, and obviously that will lead to uh, the, you know, the, the survival of the community, okay? Uh, its language and culture, and all that within the confines of supporting some kind of a vision that ties to Canadian unity, okay? That's the only one I can find. If someone can find another, another definition for school governance better than that one, you let me know. So basically it means that we elect a school board and they run schools. And thank you for your check, government, and we'll see you next year when we report time. So in, to give you, some, to give you some, some quotations, Luc Desjardins, who's a lawyer in New Brunswick, he says, on gouverne les conseils scolaires, mais les fonds attribués par Fredericton, les programmes, la taille des classes, la construction des écoles, dictés par Fredericton. Bref, en matière d'éducation, on gouverne plus dans le fantasme que dans la réalité. So that's New Brunswick's model 
of which we, we think we govern our schools, we really don't. Guillaume Leblanc, à titre d'acteur charnière de la société civile acadienne et la structure gouvernementale, quel rôle devraient jouer les élus municipaux acadiens, les conseils scolaires, les élus acadiens et francophones des régies de santé? So, is, a, is someone who administers hospitals in New Brunswick, someone who administers schools, could they all work together as a common front? Okay, New Brunswick represents $1.7 billion of common asset. So you talk about money, the Canadians do have the capacity to influence government. They do. Le conseil sont en quelque sorte le cœur de l'âme de CED. Ça, c'est le conseil scolaire. Ça, c'est la définition de l'association des conseillers scolaires de New Brunswick. Cherchez l'erreur. Ce sont des hommes et des femmes qui s'intéressent à l'éducation et qui connaissent bien leur milieu. Cela leur permet de s'assurer que les programmes et les services répondent bien aux besoins de la population. C'est un peu vague. Ça, ça manque un peu d'ambition. Je suis très d'accord. <rire> euh, je trouve vraiment, puis ça c'est vraiment ce qu'il faut éviter, OK? Il faut évi éviter vraiment les taux. En tant que ministre, monsieur le sous-ministre adjoint, il y a un ministère, le CED, on le conseil d'éducation de district, donc le conseil scolaire, et les DG des conseils scolaires. Des con des conseils scolaires. Bon, le conseil scolaire, le conseil scolaire là, il est pris en milieu, lui. Il n'y a pas de moyens. Il n'est pas vraiment son rôle en tant qu'élu qu est un peu mitigé, OK, au Nouveau-Brunswick. Donc, là, ça, là, il faut vraiment éviter ça. Si on fait la pleine justice scolaire, il faut avoir tout le droit de gérer les écoles, point barre. Puis ça, ça c'est une définition de, de conseiller scolaire de faire différentes lois. Ça, c'est les budgets. Intéressant, parce que nous, Brunswick, on parle des budgets du CED, 300 millions. Ça, c'est un, 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 un très petit conseil scolaire en, 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 en Québec, en passant. Mais quand tu mets les CED, les municipalités, l'Université de Moncton, le conseil, le conseil, euh, le collège communautaire et vitalité, la santé, c'est 1,6 milliard. C'est de l'argent, là. On commence à parler de vraies choses. Si les gens pourraient travailler ensemble, on arrivera à faire beaucoup de choses. Oui, j'arrive, Sylvia, je le vois. Bon, C'est quoi un enseignant? Bien, puis là, Guy va pas m'aimer, mais là. Mais c'est ça, le cursus d'un enseignant, OK? Il est étudiant, il va étudier, il va au collège, il gradue, il devient enseignant, il devient une école, puis à la fin, il prend sa retraite. C'est ça. OK? Il faut éviter de faire ça quand on gère les écoles. Il faut vraiment les inculquer des valeurs culturelles pour qu'ils font au-delà du programme scolaire tel que préconisé. Puis il faut penser à faire des écoles des milieux communautaires. La pire affaire, c'est sortir les parents de l'école. Il faut qu'il y ait une place au sein de l'école. Il faut que l'école soit un lieu où les citoyennetés se rencontrent, surtout en situation minoritaire. Vraiment important. Ça, on parle des questions des affaires branchées. Et ça, ben, c'est une salle de classe moderne où on peut s'asseoir et faire des choses. Mais l'affaire importante, puis la dernière chose, je vais vous laisser, puis c'est la suite que je voudrais vraiment avoir. Oh, oh. Le truc au début qui flashait, là, que je n'arrive pas à voir sur l'écran, c'est qu'au Nouveau-Brunswick, une fois qu'on a... Là, je finis là-dessus. Au Nouveau-Brunswick, une fois qu'on a réalisé qu'il y avait un écart, puis il y, y a des économistes qui ont étudié ça, puis on dit, il y a un écart entre la capacité des écoles françaises et la capacité des écoles anglaises au niveau de la, au niveau de la série de catapulter okay, certains services d'avance. On a créé un fonds spécial pour les écoles francophones. Voilà. Puis de ça, on a décidé de faire un plan. On appelle ça la PALC. Puis la PALC, c'est le programme d'aménagement linguistique et culturel. Et la PALC, c'est en fait une, une stratégie communautaire où tout le monde joue un rôle dans la question culturelle et l'identité des élèves. Donc, le mouvement économique, les jeunes, les hôpitaux, les organismes communautaires, les, les petites enfances, tout le monde joue un rôle dans la création de ça. Et c'est ce qu'on a changé. Ce n'est pas aussi provoca provocateur que Sylvie aurait aimé, là, mais c'est ça comme ça. this 
Palk thing. What's it called again, P? Programme d'aménagement d'agriculture culturelle, Palk. In, uh, in Ontario, they have a uh, pa PAL. Programme d'aménagement linguistique. Yes, Programme d'aménagement linguistique. Actually, it was started when I was there many, 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 many years ago. Yes, we still uh, put a statue for you somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about, so I'm curious to know in Ontario and New Brunswick, even Newfoundland, is access to minority language restricted? Do you have an equivalent law restricting eligibility or admissibility to minority language schools? Well, we're not the one who decided to restrict, uh, in Ontario, we're not the one who decided to restrict the, uh, the, the, uh, the school. It's the section 23 of the, of the charter that does, that does that, that says those who have access are those who are entitled under section 23. But there's also the uh, possibility for, uh, in law, in the legislation, or regulation, I can't, I'm not sure, one of the two, don't hold me to this one, for a school committee to decide whether a, a child could receive his education in French, even though he's not totally, perfectly uh, one of the child of the charter. I'll give you an example. We have child who would, would not normally, but the grandparents were. Although you can prove that your great-grandparents received it or some ah, then you were assimilated, then okay, we're going to take you to buck the, buck the, the, the trend and, 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 and bring you back into the system. So, and you would go into other places where the, in Ontario at least, the school boards might give that definition a very, very, very wide berth. So there's nothing uh, in the, in the, from the government that say, thou shall not go over there. It's more tolerated, as I said before. In, uh, in, in New Brunswick, it's a little more tight. Uh, the application of the Article 23 is a little bit more uh, segregated in that regard. Um, across, across the country, it varies. In New Brunswick, based in, in Newfoundland, for example, there's a petition system, a little bit like in Ontario, where you can actually go and petition, um, which has led over the years, and I'm very frank with you, led over the years to, be, to, to create some very strange situations. For example, the Francophone School Board of St. John's is the, the guy who works there, who is the director of finance. Okay? He's been working there now since the school board was created. He's a Newfoundlander, speaks extremely good French, but he's an anglophone. And when I, was, when I was president of the school board, one of the questions I asked is, Peter, why did you not put your kids in the program? Well, he said, I couldn't. So what do you mean? Well, he told me I couldn't. Well, I see you could have had a bit more. You, you, you could have opted not to accept that as an answer, okay? Um, but he regrets that to this day. And to me, it, it makes no sense to me, and this, I'm always, and I've always be, become, I've always defended that, is that if you believe from a common ground perspective that you adhere to the principles of a francophone school, exactly. and you'd like for your children to partake in that experiment, because I think it is an experiment, okay? Uh, then why wouldn't you have the right so I know a lot of Anglophone parents who have, you know, either either the exogamous marriages or whatever, who are sometimes a lot more engaged, okay, in Francophone school life than the the spouse who is Francophone, for whatever reason. There you go. My question is: We face a major problem with the federal government. Many of them have transferred the religion from Canada and English to Quebec into French. Spicer, the very first committee of official languages, and Michael Enright, they coined the phrase Westmount Rhodesians. That's how we were seen by OCOL. We face a major problem in that many of our intellectuals oppose our stance. I was the guy in Reliance Quebec, the Anglo organization, who moved the motion, uh, be it resolved, we abolish, you know, we have freedom of choice in education. I was shot down by Charles Taylor and others. Taylor is a major Quebec Question. intellectual. Well, Taylor opposes us. Our intellectuals oppose us. And our, our, you're dead right calling people names. I, I called them, uh, you know, uh, appeasers. I should have called them collaborators because they join in. They, I'm Question. taking, well, I'm just taking a thing from his, his, uh, his uh, hymn book. You're dead right. But I can't get the people in English Quebec to call them even collaborators, they won't do it. 
because they're intellectually they've transferred their allegiance. We face a big problem here. The Quebec state is of French Canadians, by French Canadians, for French Canadians. You, the state shapes society in Quebec. In Ontario, you have the old British idea the people should shape the state. So I we face that, a, I think that, uh, okay, yeah. do you see the problem I'm yeah, facing? I think, but I think, I think there's, a, there's a little different, it's a difference. We are not a threat to the English majority. We're not viewed as a threat to the English majority. So we're not viewed as a threat. So, you know, it's okay to give our school system, it's okay to give us access to health and to justice and things. It, it, it doesn't seem like it, there's no menace to the majority. I think here there's a, lot of francophones and who, anglophones. who and I, maybe anglophones i won't go there uh, you know more than i do but lots of francophones who have a, this irrational fear and i think it's a very you have to contend with this you have to deal with this you have to be able to manage this fear and that may be why some people you call collaborators but it might be some people who are trying to find bridges or something with the other community but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you should just wash out your difference and say, we are not Anglophones anymore. I think you have a responsibility to the country to maintain a, a large and vibrant minority. I'm saying to this country, the day we lose the reality of minority community across the country, in Quebec and outside Quebec, this country is doomed because we will, be, we will have a French Quebec, which will be quasi-independent or independent, and you have a Western Canada and a Eastern Canada with nothing in common to, to get to. What will be common between Vancouver and, uh, and uh, St. John, Newfoundland? There will be nothing. So the North and South will be. So this will be the end of the country. We are the keeper of this country together. You've got a task to do this, and we'll do it in our place. Yay! I love this man. Emma. Hi. Um, so I work with the Emma Legault. Emma Legault. I work for the uh, Community Learning Center Initiative here in Quebec. And I guess my question is more one to compare and contrast. So we get funds from Heritage Canada that comes in. Um, and the funds are intended for both student success and community vitality. However, as it gets funneled into Quebec, it only gets tabled by educators. So I'm wondering if in Ontario it's any different. Is there any intersectoral representation or groups like QCGN that get to have a say on how funds are distributed? Or is it like here that it's sort of uniquely funneled through educational bodies? No, we are not privy to this. But there has been an understanding with the minister, with Minister Jolie when she was heritage minister, that in the current round of negotiation, the National Federation, the Fédération Nationale des Conseils Scolaires Francophones, the National, but you know, Conseil Scolaire, the Federation will have a will have a regard into the negotiation themselves between the, uh, the Heritage Ministry have, yeah. and the provinces. The provinces are not happy about this. It's not an easy thing for them to have an outside group look into it, but I mean, it was an engagement, uh, no, a, an underta undertaking, undertaking of the Minister Jolie to include them. What this will look like, we don't know yet, but what the result will be, but it's the first time, at least, that the school board representative will be able to see what's done with the money of going somewhere. Ali, you had something to uh, ajouter? Yeah, in 1988, uh, the CNPF, which was the Commission National de Parla Francova, a uh, published study called Scandale National. And what that was, was they were able to study, and they undertook a major study that found that um, a large portion of monies that were destined to Francophone education had gone to pave roads. Um, I'm not <laughs> saying that it has changed a lot in certain provinces since then, because it hasn't, okay? Um, New Brunswick's a bit better, okay? Uh, is probably one of the, the examples in, 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 in Canada that works. Because of, dual, because of the duality system, they actually, you know, francophones have a direct input in the actual purse. Uh, elsewhere, it's a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, in Newfoundland, for example, uh, there's at least five positions at the school board that are funded through federal dollars, which should not be, because obviously those, those, those uh, monies are designed for cultural, other, you know, for teaching or for 
associated services. So it's a mixed bag, uh, but I think if there was one future battle that I think that we're going to look into seriously, and other provinces have started to look into that, is going to court on uh, the federal provincial agreements in education. Oh, great. But, but great I, answer. But, but I, there's one thing that you have to say, and I think it's probably the same thing in Quebec. For example, for every dollar that comes from heritage through this PNOF, the province of Ontario spends 17. So it's not one on one. I mean, no. We spend, the government of Ontario spends a lot of money on the French language system. So even if there was no money from, from the federal government, the, 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 the system would still be financed I mean, by the province. So we, we do, we, we want to know where the money goes, but in the end, I don't want to be in such a position that they say, you got a dollar, then we're going to put only one dollar because we'll Good be point. huge losers. My list, I have Mike Murray. I was concerned to hear you say that once uh, bilingualism uh, becomes generalized, uh, assimilation is uh, virtually uh, uh, guaranteed. Uh, one of the points that uh, the Anglophone community in Quebec has been particularly proud of is the extent to which it has become bilingual over the last two or three decades. Uh, would you comment on the, uh, the future, as you see it, of that movement? Well, it, it's a density issue, obviously, right? I mean, I'm not a linguist. I can only tell you what linguists say. But it is a density issue. Obviously, if you have a population density that is not able to sustain itself on a geographical limitation, uh, well, it's a lot harder. Obviously, what we've been trying to do in Francophone Canada, you know, has over the last 50 years, based on that assertion, based on the worst case scenario, what do you do to avoid that? What do you do to reverse that so that tendency doesn't become a, a be it, you know, a, 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 an end all and be all? So while linguists say that, I always say, well, it can't always apply because I wouldn't be speaking to you in French today if that would be, if that would be the case. Um, but I think it's more of, a, of, a, of, of, of an attempt to make people understand that this is, end of the day, extremely fragile. And there are people in this room here who know this stuff a lot better than I. I'm not an academic by any stretch of imagination. I cursed through university and I managed to get out of it. But, um, you know, it, it, at, at, at the base, uh, you have to know what the end game or the worst case scenario is and you work against that. And I think that I always tell it to people that that's what we don't want to have, but if you don't work, that's what it'll become. But you need something else. I mean, you cannot only have schools. You have to have around you, if you, if you want to make sure that you counter that, you have to have an entire system, an entire uh, breathing system of health systems, of justice, of uh, culture, community centers. I mean, you need something. If you just produce bilingual people, after a while, things are going to disappear. You need, in the fundamental language, the one from the beginning, where you stop your own one, you need to have a country of places where you can express that part of the language. Otherwise, it just gets a tool, and that's going to be the problem. And early child education is of utmost importance. If you don't have, if you don't have daycares and, and daycare. you know. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Ali. Um, New Brunswick went through a reflection some years ago on the future of school boards, got rid of them, yeah. brought them back after a certain amount of time yeah. as district educational education councils. Um, what was, could you tell us how that played out constitutionally? And secondly, um, what was gained or lost, if anything, in that transition? Yeah, well, some would argue, I think, that one thing that, we, that was lost was you've uh, removed the claw from the tiger. Uh, I think the the, age, the school boards we have now have a lot less, um, for example, in Newfoundland for a small school board, of which there's only six schools, uh, 2,500 francophones, we can name our own schools. We have the right to name our schools. In New Brunswick, where there's uh, official bilingualism and there's duality, and they can't, it's an administrative decree. Uh, so that's the kind of things I think over the years have been lost. The, I think as a young francophone, if you see a school called Gilbert Finn Academy or whatever, whatever. I think you see who you are, okay? A school called Cité de l'Amitié, okay, okay? Doesn't really, 
No more of it. <laughs> Something a bit more, a bit more gutsy. Uh, so I think we lost that. Constitutionally, obviously, but in the confines of Article 23 and all that, I mean, that's, that's obviously the basis, right? When, when Francophones and Anglophones lost their schools, uh, constitutionally, it didn't hold water. So because of, because of the equality of the two communities in New Brunswick, it made no sense politically to create school boards for Francophones only. So when you brought back school boards, so you can have yours and you can have yours and everybody's going to be all hunky-dory all over again. Uh, but I think it still is very fragile, and I think in New Brunswick, I think one thing that has been lost, if we're going to really concentrate on, on, on real tangible things, is that the Department of Education is extremely interventionist, <laughs> very interventionist, to the point where personally, as a, as, a, as a former school board president, it kind of makes me sick to see the point where which day, you know, like school board, school board email addresses have been, have been eliminated. Everybody's got a GNB address now. I think that's wrong. I think the school board had to be very independent and very in your face and not afraid to tell, you know, tell, tell, minister, tell ministers to. <laughs> it's not a question, it's a comment. And um, yes, I hope so. And um, Guy has mentioned the fact that, you know, he's an activist and I know Guy for years, you know, because we're in the same boat. And my colleague, uh, Rodrigue, mentioned this morning about the fact that, you know, there is no research money, uh, the funding to support minorities. But I have to mention that when Guy was doing his activities to open, you know, the school boards, at Oise University of Toronto, I was a professor, and we have the mandate as part of our community service to do research action to open schools. Because in some, in the rural areas, the Anglophone majority was very strong in the fact that there won't be any French schools in their areas like Carton Place, Owen Sound, and so on. So, we have the mandate of that, and not only that, I have to maybe, you know, to remind people the importance of research action where we will attend, I will attend meetings with the president of the boards, and uh, both of us will receive eggs and tomatoes on our face, you know, like until midnight. And I think this is part of the story that, you know, we don't write about it. But we know. We've got one short question from Bill here. OK, just very quickly. Um, I think there's a bit of an undercurrent in, in some of the exchanges. And it's very, very helpful to have the exchange between you know, your experience outside Quebec with Francophone communities. Of course, for English-speaking Quebecers, there's additional challenges. It's not, as you say, uh, Guy, not the same sense that um, you know, the, the English group and English language is a threat to the Franco majority. You don't experience that out there. But it is also true, though, that for English-speaking Quebecers, uh, the threat is not so much language transfer, but it's the notion of, of exodus. And uh, whether it's in great numbers or in selective on migration, as different uh, research has shown. So you know, one little catchphrase that I've used over the years is that for Francophones outside of Quebec, the challenge is to live in French. The challenge for Quebec Anglophones is to live in Quebec. So, you know, and, and in, in that sense, I think, you know, there was reference to the notion of construction identitaire. And uh, if I may say, I think that, that the Francophone community outside of Quebec, uh, through the school system, understand that double mandate. You know, that, that it's not just to educate the children to be successful, but it's to contribute to the building of the community. And perhaps in a way, English-speaking Quebecers have kind of taken a lot for granted. You know, you can defy the laws of gravity and just float on as a, as a vital community without taking care of it. That, that's one comment. The, the last thing, then, is just a question, really. This kind of exchange is very useful. Um, already in the role I'm in, I've had exchanges with people involved with the, uh, at the Minister de Conseil Exécutif, with the Bureau de Quebec in Toronto and Moncton, and they're very eager to promote exchange between English-speaking Quebecers and Franklin's minority situation. Do you see that as, as a useful thing to continue? Do you think there are possibilities there? Thanks, Bill. I certainly do, because I'm the executive director of the Canadian Foundation for Cross-Cultural Dialogue. I mean, if I was not in favor of this, I would probably lose my job. <laughs> and I'm challenging you then for one thing. I do things like, for example, uh, stand -up for, uh, uh, training for kids in secondary schools to do stand-up. So I do this in French language schools outside of Quebec. What I want to do in my next generation of programming is to put Anglophones in Quebec with Francophones in Quebec, also 
not only necessarily outside Quebec, francophones in Quebec, that they would do together training to do stand-up so that they would you know, bridge this. I don't know these people or they're anglophones, you know, like you probably have horns and tails in the back or something. But I think it's important to find those real experience. It's not, it's not useful to bring kids from, from, from uh, Toronto or Montreal, uh, from, uh, from Ottawa, we're going to go and see Quebec City and things. That's not the real life experience that you want to communicate between, between our two solitudes that we started in the beginning. We have to build those bridges. I'm ready to do something. So I figure that my two friends are now your friends, and they've done a wonderful job here this morning, so let's thank them. Merci tout le monde. Bonne continuation du forum.